What I'm hoping to do today is teach you as much around the basics of irrigation as possible in the next two, two hours to two and, a half an hour, two, two and a half hours. I'm conscious that a lot of you are probably under employment and might be finishing at three or 3.30 or you're meant to be. So um, if you need to go and we're not, we haven't covered stuff off, please feel free to do so. I'm not precious about you using your phones. It's not school. If you don't look at me or listen to me for the whole time, I really don't mind. Uh, there's toilets through that door there and there's another toilet down the back there. Um, I was going to say in an emergency, just run out that door, but obviously Mudge has taken care of that. We have had issues in the past where it's been quite noisy here. It's a commercial area. There was, I don't know if you've been following me on Instagram for any period, there was a fan out here that was just the first month of us being here was the torment of our lives. But now we've got no noise pollution, but the people that work there are probably going to die of plastic inhalation. Um, but I don't have anything more to say on that. So, uh, Water Pro... Once you know how to install irrigation, you shouldn't need to know how to design irrigation. So WaterPro is a full service shop. We have an irrigation design department so that we can assist you with what you need from the four pop-up sprinklers in someone's courtyard home out to a full subdivision. We've got the design capacity to take care of it all. Uh, so what I'm hoping to do today is just to give you the, the understanding of how it all clicks together and the theory of why we do what we do and the reason why we use the parts that we use so that then you can go away and install it and if you get stuck you know that you've got three locations here, like obviously Dry Creek, Kent Town and Railways at, at Renella where you can go to and say look this is the area that I want to get designed what do you think I should do? Because that you're going to learn over time how to take care of those and you'll start to see things and you'll see that there's a square lawn that's four meters by four meters, you're gonna stick a sprinkler on each corner and you'll start to get a feeling for how many sprinklers you can get on a, on a line and then you'll probably need us less and less, but it's important for you to know that we're always gonna be there um, and it's part of what we do. So it's part of the service that we offer. Um, starting an irrigation business is pretty simple. Uh, obviously, if you've got a vehicle and you can get to your location, there's a very limited number of tools that you'll need. Uh, I've got them all here and further into the session I'll get you guys to start trying or using these tools. Some of them you might have used, some of them you might not have. Uh, ultimately, if you can cut your poly pipe or your PVC, strip your wire joins, close clamps and wire joins uh, and punch holes in poly pipe, you can pretty much put this whole system together. Uh, obviously you've got your wire joins wire gets joint there, um, you're going to use spanners and, and multi-grips to tighten things up. The tools that are on that bench could service you for a very long time as, as an irrigation installer, um, minus I'm guessing a shovel and a pick. So I won't talk to you about trenches, I'm going to take an um, assumption that you guys are across that. In South Australia, uh, it's important to be aware of your licensing requirements. Uh, the licensing for irrigation across the country is very diverse and if you've come from Victoria, the licensing requirements in Victoria are different from the licensing requirements in South Australia. No one's really able to give a really clear answer and I'm sure if you go to the Office of Consumer and Business Affairs, you'll get a clear answer on what you should and shouldn't be doing, but um, all I do is mention it at the start of the training that any work that you're performing including irrigation, just make sure that you're licensed to be doing what you're doing. In South Australia, if you perform certain works that you're not licensed for, the client doesn't have a responsibility legally to pay you for the labour, um, but they do for the parts. I think I should say this is general advice and I'm not a lawyer or, or I do not represent the Office of Consumer and Business Affairs. Interestingly, if you are looking at licensing assistance, I did a podcast with a guy called Sam who owns SA Trade Licensing, really good guy, used to work for the uh, Office of Consumer and Business Affairs, understands the runway in there and actually has a, a business service um, where he can take a seat, wherever Zane, um, where he will basically put the ball on the tee and, and you just have to hit it. So he'll prepare your documentation, do some mock interviews with you. I have no association with him, I don't get any financial benefit from you using him, I just think he's a good guy um, and if you need help with licensing, he's one to talk to. On the topic of regulation, uh, it's important to remember that SA Water and the government are very, very, very precious about the protection of the quality of our drinking water. This device here is a backflow prevention device. It is designed to protect the rest of the world from anything that might happen because of you. This is the most simple backflow prevention device. It goes up from there. Commercially, they'll use large above ground RPZs in cages. The idea is that if there's a blowout, um, in your drip tube or a mains water blowout, it can create drawback and it can suck the dirt and debris that's around your 
um, drip tube or it could suck uh, fertilizers and pesticides through your sprinklers and it can inject that back into the mains drinking water. Obviously that water then goes into households and people drink it or they shower in it and it's a contaminant. So be across the fact that you need backflows. I think they're underused. Uh, this is probably the first thing people remove from a system when they're trying to save money. Uh, and it's, I don't know what they are now. No one here would be able to say 35 bucks trade or something like, it's just important to be aware of it. They do ones off the tap as well. Uh, which I don't have here, but if you're putting a tap timer on a tap, you should have a single check valve stopping the water from that as well. So that's that. I've got some notes here. I've done these training sessions a lot and they always vary. Every one of them is recorded, as I said earlier, and they're on, the, on YouTube. Um, if you're searching for it on YouTube, just search Water Pro AU and you'll find them. Uh, I guess if there's anything that, if you get to the end of this and you kind of feel like you haven't picked up a snippet of it or you feel like there's a gap there, um, I have no limit on how much time I'm happy to talk to you about this for. So if you want me to go through something again and you want to stay back or you want to come to another session or whatever it is, or you want me to try and find you some literature because you want to study it further on your own, there's a lot that we can do. Um, I, I really, I wouldn't do these, th like th the idea behind this is I want you to walk away feeling more confident about installing irrigation so that it's done properly, it's better for the industry. We, we then get better represented, represented in society. The government aren't looking negatively on things because they're not being done properly and it just makes the industry better. The industry has been really good to me. Um, I have a very good life thanks to irrigation. And so I feel like it's, I don't know, it sounds a bit wanky, but it, it's good to put back. But I wanna make sure that if you get to the end of this and you feel like you haven't learned enough, just keep asking me questions. So I think that's it from a, all the fancy like legal jargon. So with irrigation, um, I guess as simply as we can put it, we're taking a water source and delivering it to something horticulturally in most cases. Obviously there's irrigation systems to keep birds cool in bird cages and all that, but the majority of the time we're trying to water uh, a crop or plants or a lawn. Now, the, the brands that we stock and the brands that most professional shops that you deal with like actual irrigation shops, not hardware shops that sell irrigation, the majority of them are going to stock professional quality brands that have data behind them around the application rate of water that they deliver. And um, uh, I mean, that's ultimately it, but the, the amount of litres per minute that you need for a sprinkler to, to be able to work, the amount of litres per minute that's going to come out of some drip tube. And then as an irrigation shop, our responsibility is to take the information you've got, turn it into a functioning system and then you take the system and everything's happy. So it, it's quite simple, but there's obviously things along the way that you're gonna struggle that, that could cause you problems. So uh, we offer that free irrigation design service that I talked about earlier. Uh, it gets, eventually it gets to a point where we charge. So if you came to us and wanted an irrigation design for a golf course, we'd have to charge you for it. But if you wanted an irrigation, there's probably been footy ovals where we've kind of looked at it and gone, um, will charge you for the design because a football oval is probably a $3,000 irrigation design and then we might offset the cost of that against the supply if you went ahead with us. But for anything that you're doing residentially, it's a service that we offer. Um, we've got trained irrigation design teams in all of the businesses. So the things we need from you to be able to give you a quality irrigation a design and estimate is a flow test and a scaled diagram. So uh, we'll, prop we'll do a flow test later on when we go out there. You can do them, have we got a flow test here, a flow test gauge here? Can you see if you can find me one, please? Um, the rawest version of a flow test is turning the tap on fully and sticking a bucket underneath it and timing it. Uh, most of the time you're running a nine or 10 litre bucket and you'll fill it up in 18 to 30 seconds and you'll bring that information to us and then we know how many litres per minute you've got. Like I said, we'll do one out there when we put the system together. It's good enough for most situations. Um, when we do a commercial system, we actually request uh, pressure tests, pressure versus flow tests along the way. If Adam can find me the, the, the gauge that we use, I'll show you that. We mount that to a water source, we adjust a bull valve to a point where the pressure gauge needle hits 200 kPa or 300 kPa or 400 kPa. And then there's a digital flow meter on it that we use that tells us how many litres per minute are coming out. That flow that, that comes back to us, so we'll get, um, uh, someone will come back and say we've got 200 kPa um, at this and 300 at this and 400 at this um, and it might be you know 120 litres a minute how will this go 300 
um, 130 and 140. They're not correct, but you get the gist. So then our irrigation designers can take that, because once we get into a commercial system, and this is not basic, but once we get into a commercial system, um, a lot can go wrong if that information is not correct. So we'll design a system and someone will go install it and then they'll turn it on and nothing will happen. And then you've got concrete paths and finished landscaping and playgrounds that have been put in and there's nothing you can do about it. So the planning of this is really important and you're gonna find the same residentially. There's nothing worse than having to go back and put another solenoid valve in because you're trying to split your lawn into two lines and you're digging up an existing lawn and your client thinks you're an idiot. Um, we take that, we take all that risk out by doing a, a flow test at the start, either with the bucket, thank you Adam, um, or a device like this. So we sell these, we would lend this to you if you need it, it's not about me trying to sell you one of these. Um, the guys that are doing, and girls, I say guys, when I say guys, I mean humans, um, that are doing irrigation as a full-time gig, generally have one of these in their cars and they're testing their, water, uh, their pressure versus flow. So that'll go on the water source, they adjust the bull valve, until this needle gets to the pressure that we want, so 200 or 300 or 400 kPa. Those, the reason I've given you those numbers, most systems will have that kPa and most irrigation systems will work as low as that. So we'll talk about that a bit further on. And then this just gives you a digital reading, real simple. You just have it running off of a tap and then that just kind of keeps the number going and it tells you the flow rate that it got to. Uh, we sell it with a bunch of other gear so that you can use it to get it away from your pants and your shoes and the client's garden beds and windows. Most of the time a system like that's going on a 40 mil water meter in a in lights view or Mount Barker on a new subdivision when we're trying to understand the flow relationship and we're doing it into a, uh, a wheelie bin. So you get the information, you bring us a scale diagram, one to a hundred is generally what we're getting residentially. It doesn't really matter what it is as long as the scale um, is something that we know and that we can work with. Then our team will design you an irrigation system. Uh, there is a video on YouTube for that, on how to get to that level. I think it's like a five or seven minute video of how to do a flow test, how to draw the plan. But ultimately what will come back to us is someone will draw up their house. They'll have you know a driveway. Oh, we've got a lawn here, there's garden there. And then we've got another lawn out the back and there's you know a garden bed all around the back. And then we'll say, okay, where's the water source? Oh, there's water there. Is there water out here? No, there's not. Okay, would you want us to run a line out the back? Have we got concrete paths in the way? Like the, more, the more information we've got, the better the quality of the irrigation design and the quote's gonna be for you. Um, and if we don't get all the information, we're gonna come back to you for it. At that point, we'll ask you if you wanted to use, like, are you using pop-up sprinklers? Are you using MP rotators? Do you wanna use r -vans? These are maybe unfamiliar terms to some of you, but we'll go through that. Are you looking to irrigate the garden bed with drip tube or individual drippers? We get all that information together and then we can create a design. Um, the quality of your design to us will completely dictate the quality of the quote and the design that we get back to you. Um, with the science that's behind what we do, the only error that we're gonna have is human error. Like this, it's not, if, if, if you've got 18 litres a minute and we design a system that's gonna pop up at 12 litres a minute, it just works. The only reason it's not gonna work is if we've been given incorrect data or something's changed environmentally in the system. So if a, if a pipe's blocked or a solenoid valve's not, um, the flow control's not completely open or there's a hole at the end and the water's getting out. So we do the design and then we would prepare an estimate and obviously then you know what's going on. Something important to note with this, if there's elevation changes, we need to know that. Um, and that's probably it. And then where you want your controller location and where there's power. Obviously, if there's a controller in the house um, and you want to have your solenoid valves out there, we need to be able to get power out to the solenoid valves. So there'll, there'll be questions that we ask. So what I'm going to talk about first, as for the irrigation side of things, um, is the application of water. So. Obviously, in the, in the world that we're dealing in, it's pretty much sprinklers and drippers. Uh, the traditional spray, uh, this is a traditional spray head. Uh, you would have seen them, I don't know, how, some of you are probably too young, but um, they just pop up and they just spray water. They don't have any brains behind them. The good ones have wind tunnel data and they have flow data and precipitation rates so we can understand how they're gonna react um, when they're in a system. So. With a lawn like this, um, if there's a sprinkler in each corner, which is how we would design it properly, 
A sprinkler, like a traditional 10 foot arc, is something like three liters per minute per corner. So that's three, right? An arc, an arc, uh, sorry, an MP rotator, which is pretty much, has, does anyone know, not know what an MP rotator is? You guys seen these? The finger sprays, they're the hunter version of that. They're the lowest flow nozzle that you can buy currently. I think, and I might be wrong, but it's something around like 0.87 of a litre per minute for the same distance. So they're a low flow nozzle. So we would, at this level where we're talking to you, we'd, we'd kind of try to understand whether or not you want to spray or a, a, ro a rotary nozzle. You've obviously got the um, impact sprinklers, the ones that are kind of not a thing anymore. Gear drives pretty much superseded them. So gear drives are the ones that you'd see in parks that just have an arm of water or, or a rain curtain of water if it's a rainbird sprinkler. And they just go back and forth. And then the uh, R-Van, which is that one that's a rainbird and the Hunter MP rotator, they're the ones that have the finger sprays. So the, the idea behind these is that they're a matched precipitation sprinkler. I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, so you've got sprinklers and then you've got drip tube. So you've either got drip tube on a, on a line, so the brown or the purple, you would have seen, we've got purple tube up there. Purple tube is purple to signify that it's uh, reclaimed water or recycled water, it's not for human consumption. The theory is that you as an intelligent human being will see purple and not wrap your mouth around the drip tube for a drink. I don't understand a person that's gonna wrap their mouth around drip tube for a drink is the same person that's probably not gonna look at what color it is. Um, we've got brown, we've got purple. Brown looks good on dirt and under mulch purple tells you don't drink it. So the quality of the recycled water that we're getting is pretty good, so you're probably not gonna get sick from it, but my advice, don't wrap your mouth around any irrigation at all. Now, you've got the drip tube that's got drippers in line, and then you can buy individual drippers. We'd be having the conversation with you at the time where we're designing this system around whether or not you believe the system warrants drip line or individual drippers. If you've got a garden bed that's quite sparse, obviously like some of the stuff you like, you've done Craig where there's 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 like square meters where there might not be something you might want to be a little bit more um, precise about where you're putting water if you've got a garden where the client's just going to plant the whole thing out or you're going to plant the whole thing out that's when we're going to look at using drip tube the idea behind drip tube is that we just create this complete blanket of water and that you don't even have to think about where you're planting you're not thinking that this has to sit within 30 centimeters of a root bulb to try and encourage root growth out it's just wet. So the way that would work, there's a dripper every 30 or 40 centimeters and it basically creates a bulb of water underground depending on the soil profile and then wherever you stick a plant, where it's gonna find water. So there are your two delivery methods, drip and spray. We would talk to you about which one you think is most appropriate for your job. Um, it could be that you have low flow and low pressure and we need to design around that. It could be that the client's budget's quite low and that we need to design around that. The van sprinklers, a nozzle is, I don't know, $2. Don't quote me on that if you're coming in and negotiating. But say it's $2, um, an MP rotator, some shops will sell them for $18. So there's a massive difference there. But there's also this, um, I guess, false economy. If you've got a lot of them, and you're trying to run them on a solenoid valve, if you've only got 12 liters a minute, you're only gonna get maybe three of these to run where you might get 10 of these to run. So there's this further thought process as to whether or not you're actually saving your client money by going with, an, uh, with a van nozzle, but then you're costing them more, more money because you're putting in uh, more solenoid valves, more cable, more infrastructure. So the idea when we're applying water is to get a matched precipitation. So I talked about that before. The precipitation is the amount of water that's falling. It's, it's, um, we're trying to simulate rainfall and then to try and understand how much we can, once we understand how much we can deliver from a system, we can then reverse engineer that and then tell this controller how long to turn the water on to give the right amount of water for the area. So when, I guess we go into situations where we have water restrictions or there's um, clients that are heavily concerned about the amount of water that they're paying for or the amount of water that they're using, you as an irrigation contractor can say to them, all right, so we've done the numbers and we've got six solenoid valves 
um, for us to deliver 25 mil of equivalent rainfall onto your lawn and garden every week during these periods, you're gonna need 5,000 litres of water every 30 days. You now know the cost of your water and you can take them this really, um, I guess, clear and powerful piece of information and say like, it's gonna cost us, it's gonna cost you $5,000 for us to irrigate, but um, this, and then it's gonna cost you $3,000 a quarter or whatever it is, $3,000 a year, and they can then make an informed decision and it makes you guys look like you know what you're talking about. The reason it's important to understand that one of the reasons uh, you get clients with rainwater tanks that want to hook up their 3,000 litre rainwater tank and water their 100 square metres of turf for four years from one rain. When people actually get a visual on that, you know, a lawn this big, say that's four metres squared and it's 25 mil per square metre. So 100, say 100 litres every, it's probably not a good example because it's so small, but say it's 100 or 200 litres a week, a 3,000 litre rainwater tank, and that's a tiny lawn, looks quite substantial to a lot of people. But when you say, oh, you'd probably be able to water your lawn maybe five times, like so once a week for five weeks, they start to get a real understanding that they don't, the rainwater tank maybe wasn't the best investment from a financial standpoint. From an environmental standpoint, beautiful, you're doing the right thing, you're trying to reduce your impact, but you're really going to need 20, 30, 40,000 litres worth of rainwater storage if you want to take a residential irrigation system completely off grid and only be irrigating from rainfall, depending on obviously spring rains and autumn rains. Uh, so we are going to give you a, a data around this when we've designed it. MP rotators deliver 11 mil an hour if they're designed properly. So general rule of thumb for turf is to deliver 25 mil of equivalent rainfall a week. We know that they deliver 11, so we do two and a half hours or two and a third hours or whatever it works out to over the period of a week. We can then take into consideration rain. So we go, okay, well we had eight mil of rain this week, but the weather's still 24, 25. We still need to get 18 or 16 litres, 16, litres, uh, 16 mil out. Let's water for an hour and some change kind of thing. Hey, how you doing? Um, so, the difference between the MP rotator and the other spray nozzles is that it's not as simple to match the precipitation. So the way Hunter have designed these nozzles, you can pretty much stick a 1,000, a 2,000 and a 3,000 wherever you want on a system and they're going to deliver the same mil per hour per square metre. So you can safely just stick it all there and you're going, that's fine. With the 10As or even with gear drives, you can't stick a 10A and a 12A and a 15A on the same line and get match precipitation. So that's where you're going to get that uneven watering. Um, so I would encourage you where possible, if the client's comfortable to use either the Rainbird R-Van or the Hunter MP Rotator for their sprinklers, you're going to be getting a more accurate um, precipitation rate. If the budget's really tight, I mean, the reality is, what I'm going to teach you is the perfect world situation and every time you come into the shop, the guys are going to give you a perfect world situation, Wi-Fi controller, um, the best possible cobra clamps and whatever else. We'd start at that point and then you can work your way down. If you want to start removing controllers and you want to try running it off a tap timer or you want to remove the sprinklers from one side. I mean, we've got plenty of situations where someone's trying to water a verge and we say that you need to have sprinklers on both sides of the verge and they say, I don't want to spray water towards the road. Get rid of those and we'll just have those four. It's like, we can't force people to put irrigation in how we want them to. All we can do is give you the information and then you can give them the information and then they can choose how they want to work with that. So we design a system. We always try to, so say um, if we've got 18 litres a minute from the test that we did, we won't push these out to 18 litres a minute. And we've had recent situations where tap timers uh, have shaved 10 litres a minute from a system. So we've had a, had a flow test done at 30 litres a minute. We've sent out a system that's been designed 18 litres a minute and it hasn't popped up. But the, the hole inside a, of an irrigation controller, tap timer, is so small that it just chokes the water. So be aware of that. Um, our team that do design now are aware of that. In that situation, we ended up giving the client a free tap timer because we weren't even really conscious of it. I think the design was done at 19 litres a minute and we were getting 20 litres a minute out of the timer, so it was really close. Generally, we'll design to about 0.75 or 0.8 of the full flow. 
just to take into account any real real world changes um, you know house blocks obviously getting cut in half and then two houses being built on the same block sharing the same 20 mil water source um, council obviously starting to irrigate parks and gardens in new subdivisions that weren't being irrigated before SA water or all water turning down the pressure and the flow in their system to protect their pipeline so that they reduce the costs of maintenance on an aging piping system there's so many things that are happening along the way um, new houses are getting fixed pressure reducers fitted at the front of the house that are reducing the pressure to protect modern technology um, washing machines and, and dishwashers obviously can't handle the kind of pressure that they would have when they were made 20 years ago so if we design down and keep it down low it protects the client from any of those issues um, and it's just an industry standard so what I had the guys do is build this board. This is the first time we've had the board for a training session. I wanted to, to try and be as visual as possible and then obviously be as hands-on as possible when we can, so I want to get into that as soon as we can. Uh, when you have, so you, you, we got to a point where we've chosen, we're going to put sprinklers on the lawn, we're going to put um, drip tube in the gardens. You don't have to do that, but for the sake of the training, we'll do that. You can run that system off of an irrigation controller with a um, solenoid valve, or you can do it with a manual bull valve. You can, it, it really depends on how much money the client wants to spend. And then um, in some cases, the accessibility. So if you've got, a, got an existing property where there's concrete everywhere and you can't physically get cable out to a solenoid valve bank without it looking ugly, we can go with a battery operated solenoid valve in the ground. You just have to obviously replace the batteries every year or two, depending on um, how, um, how often it's turning on and off. While I'm talking about precipitation rates, sorry, I do jump around a bit, but I'm trying to keep it as on track as possible. Um, with precip, soil types, different soil types can receive different volumes of water differently. Uh, 11 mil an hour is, is quite a gentle amount of water for a soil profile to receive. When we're designing an irrigation system, we will look at the difference between sandy soils, clay soils, um, and then we'll, we'll talk about the scheduling of the controller, so how, how this gets programmed to when it turns on, whether or not we have um, cycle and soak, so we water for 30 minutes, turn off. I mean, my house, my lawn slopes a fair bit, and when we put new turf down, obviously we just had landscapers in, and the soil had been so compacted that the water was just planing off. There'd been no root zone that had driven into the soil, so that the, I was watering for kind of five minutes, leaving it for 20 minutes, watering for five minutes, just to kind of let it get into the soil. As the, the root structure establishes, it's not that bad. Um, sometimes you can probably put too much water onto a hydrophobic soil, and it's not even that hydrophobic, it's just normal, and you're trying to put too much out. When you put drip tube at 0 0.3, 0 0.3, at 1.6, it's putting something like 17 or 18 mil of precipitation out, and a lot of times the soil profile can't take that. So just be conscious of that when you're programming your controller. If you are getting flooding or, or it's planing on sloped blocks and you're just getting all this like uh, water going into the gutter, it's not necessarily because your system's got a, a leak or there's a, a, a clip that hasn't been done up properly. It could genuinely be that the water's just not getting into the soil profile. Uh, any questions about any of the stuff that we've talked about so far? Happy for you to ask questions. Like I said, I'm not precious about stuff. Um, need this to be interactive. Did you want a drink? All good. All right, so uh, from a control standpoint, we're looking at either manually controlling a system or automatically controlling a system. They're ultimately the two options. Uh, a lot of people will just run off of a tap. They want to try and keep their costs down. You can put a fitting straight off of a tap, run it out, system's fine. It's obviously going to rely on the the tenant in most cases that's living at the house not caring about the lawn or the garden and not turning it on. They're, that obviously manual systems, the most basic system. Sometimes people will build a manual system on a manifold like that and just have bull valves in the ground and just turn them on and off. Question? Yes. We, you do. Can you see if you can get me a single check? So there's a single check backflow that goes on a tap. So if in this situation, if we were going to run the like steal some water in front of the tap so what what this this is to just show you that you can take a tap off of a wall put a t in there run blue line down if the blue line came down and went to here we could stick a backflow here like this we could stick a backflow here uh, or you if you're just running a tap timer there's a single spring check that you can screw, screw straight onto the tap and put your tap timer after that and it's it's tiny it's like a I don't know, five mil little rubber and it just pops back up just to stop stuff going back. So, so recently we, we put a system in with like labor plants and whatever, but it wasn't going to work to go 
customers take care of itself. And yep. I'll just put up the tab because that's how I know how to do it. Yep. Whatever, it's not you know, your, it's yours from here. Yep. But we should just say, well, just bear in mind you need to have that. Yeah. So you can get from here. And yeah, they're sixteen dollars or something like it's. It, and the thing is, um, it, the, the important thing to highlight for them, nah. Yep, cool. I'm so glad we had that. Got this massive warehouse, and I was just waiting for him to go. We don't have any. Um, <laughs> so I'll give it to Sully. Just show him. So don't take it down there much. That's right. Give it to. Um, the you. I would say that let your client know about it, and let them make the choice. I think the biggest selling point for something like that is around them protecting the drinking water inside their house. Um, most humans will care more about themselves than others and if you say to them this is a chance that you might have a chemical suck back through your tap timer and go into your drinking water that your family are going to consume some people just don't care and to be honest 90 percent of tap timers wouldn't have one you know no one's in bunning standing in aisles saying oh you got a backflow prevention device for that pope tap timer sonny like it just it, they're going into the world i guess like i said before that's the reason for us to do these kind of training sessions to try and highlight what what could possibly happen um, the chances are so slim, but that's what all protection's in place for. It's for those things, those situations when you're not expecting it to happen. So, manually, you could stick a manifold in the ground, and instead of having these solenoid valves, you could have manual ball valves. The infrastructure cost of that's so close. Like, a, if a solenoid valve's twenty dollars, a ball valve's twelve, kind of thing. So, obviously, these solenoid valves then need wire and a controller to turn them on but not, you can turn them on manually as well just by turning a coil. Um, so you could put them in now and the client might want to add a, a controller at some point later. So there's fully automated Wi-Fi controlled irrigation controller at one end, there's ball valve garden tap turn off at the other end and there's lots in the middle. Um, all of the products in the middle can be, like I described, the, the tap timer from a hardware shop that you just turn and it costs you $15. Then there's the tap timers that have Bluetooth connectivity that you can program from your phone that might cost $90 and then you've got um, twin outlet tap timers that you've got Bluetooth that then can connect to an orbit timer that, so the, the Wi-Fi controller can talk to the tap timer and then the tap timer can be changed so it goes Bluetooth from the timer to the controller and the controller goes from Wi-Fi to the world and then you can change it from your phone so all of that's in the middle uh, today's not about going deep into all of that technology today is about highlighting to you the technology exists and almost arming you with the right uh, tools for you to walk into the, any of the shop and it doesn't have to be my shop you can go into any shop and at least if you go into an irrigation shop and say look I need uh, an irrigation system um, the client wants Wi-Fi um, or the, they're not they're not very technologically savvy they just want a manual tap timer at least you can then tell that shop what you need and then they can design it accordingly um, my guys will hate me saying this, but you could probably get two options and they could give you an automatic option and a manual option. It's a real pain in the ass for the shop because they have to do two quotes, but I don't have to physically do it, so it's fine. Uh, automatic. So with the manifolds, I'm just working through this list. Like I said, I want to try and get to building some stuff as quickly as possible. Um, the manifold that we've got here is a swivel manifold. A lot of you have probably seen these before. You can undo these fittings while they're in the ground. So usually that would be underneath a valve box. This is a valve box. So that will be in the ground. If something happens with these solenoid valves and we need to address maintenance, we turn the ball valve off, stop the water from going through, and then we can take we can undo these or undo these and take the solenoid valves out of the box, put new solenoid valves in, or we can just maintain the valves as they sit. The bottom of a solenoid valve never has a problem. So the bit that's, that's um, it's just a solid piece of plastic. The, um, you can do a lot of maintenance on the valve without actually having to take it out of the ground. The, uh, this is probably a really good example of why to choose quality brands. Uh, obviously Hunter and Rainbird would be the two brands that we have had the, the longest standing relationship. Orbit, from a control standpoint, is quite good as well. Um, the Rickdell solenoid valve that Toro makes has been around for 30 years. If you've done this for long enough, you'll start going to properties where you'll see the, the valve that was trendy in 1980 to 1990 and the valve that was trendy from 1992 to 1998, or the, or the valve that 
the new irrigation store owner got real cheap and sold into the market to try and make their, their name. So you'll, if you can try and choose reputable brands, it's gonna make it really uh, easy for you to take them apart and replace the diaphragm. The only things that go wrong with the solenoid valve are the diaphragm and the, the coil. So that piece of plastic there is in the ground and will be sitting in the ground like that. And nothing, can, like short of it being crushed, nothing changes. The inside of it, it's just solid plastic. It doesn't break down. It doesn't wear. The only thing that goes through it's water. Like it's, it's a forever thing. So if you can choose the, the brands, like you'll see, how do I best describe this? Um, a, a, a multinational plumbing chain that might decide they want to get into an irrigation business um, and are heavily focused on profit more than quality, bring in a brand from say the United States that they've got exclusivity over to try to push their way into the market and then say maybe in the last six months that brand's not available anymore, you're replacing the whole solenoid valve, you're not just replacing the diaphragm. So just think about that kind of stuff when you're putting products in the ground. Rainbird's a really good example of a company that cares about backwards compatibility. Everything that they make from a commercial standpoint with control still works. So the golf courses that have got Rainbird Central controllers from the 80s, those controllers still work with the technology that they're using today. And that's been, that was the, the owner sadly passed away just recently, but his whole thing for the whole of his business, and I'm talking their multi-billion dollar irrigation business, was backwards compatibility every time. Every nozzle still fits the same sprinkler from 40 years ago. Technology advances, but we keep making sure that the clients can keep sticking the parts back in that they used to stick in. So it's not, you know, whatever some, you know, hotshot hardware sales executive flew to Shenzhen and decided they're gonna start importing some new sprinkler nozzle at a big box hardware chain, you then can't deal with that next week or next month. And to be honest, the cost difference is not there. Like the, the amount of money you'll pay for a Rainbird or a Hunter solenoid valve is equal to what you'll pay for uh, one of those imported valves. And it's the margin that's the difference for the, man, uh, for the reseller. So uh, those manifold fittings that I talked about there are a swivel manifold fitting. There's a few different brands. We stock Tablet and Spears. I'm pretty sure uh, one of our competitors has their own um, that slides in and clicks together. I don't know much about it. From what I can tell, it's pretty good. You can make these out of PVC. I've seen plumbers lately making them out of copper because of the new B-Press um, copper press tools. You can really like, make a nice, neat manifold out of that. Uh, if you've got the two grand you want to buy, or well, four grand actually, four and a half grand, you want to buy a B-Press tool, go for it. We sell the fittings here. Uh, and then you could, or you can make them out of PVC. PVC pipe and gluing them is quite cheap, but it just adds another complexity to your business. You've got glue and primer now that you're getting on your hands or inhaling or dripping on clients' nice stonework. You've got inconsistencies around the application of glue if you're not that good at it. The good thing about these manifold fittings is they're either, they either work or they don't. And if they haven't worked, once you've put water into them, you'll tell straight away because you'll turn the ball valve on and water will start squirting out of here. And then you'll just give it a bit of a nip with the multi grips and everything's fine. So uh, that's manifolds, controllers. Um, up until recently, I've always stocked indoor and outdoor controllers. Indoor controllers are quite inexpensive. They're, I think I've got an outdoor controller here. I had one before. Oh, they're outdoor controllers. So these have had the doors removed from them. Usually they'll have a door over the top of them from a display purpose, we just keep the doors off. It protects them from the weather, it protects them from bugs crawling into the, uh, to the electronics and shorting it out and causing any problems. Because of manufacturing, most of the controllers are made in Mexico or China, the costs come down dramatically. So an indoor controller and an outdoor controller don't have that kind of price gap anymore that really makes it worth you saving that well, what would have been a hundred dollars a while, like a lot, 10 years ago, um, with an external uh, transformer. So these are really nice. The, they've got a cable that comes off them that you can plug straight into a PowerPoint. You don't have to try and find a place to put one of those big blocky transformers and have cable running to it. So we only really stock outdoor controllers now. Uh, if you wanted to buy an indoor controller, you could. The transformer's in there, it's all neat. Um, you can lock the door so that um, children, neighbors, enemies can't change your irrigation cycle and kill stuff. Um, as a contractor, there's features within these controllers to protect your, you from your clients. Uh, most of the time when a controller's been reprogrammed, it's because the client knows more about horticulture than you. 
and they think it needs more water and then they ring you and say the controller's not working anymore and you say have you touched it and they say no not at all if you want we can that's probably a separate thing but um, both I think Rainbow and Hunter now both have controller programming functions where you can put passwords against it so you can have a parent-child relationship with the controller like you might have with an iPad for a four-year-old some of your clients need that and so you'll be able to go hey I'll go in there and fix it or you can go back and do a certain um, combination of buttons it will revert back to the program that you saved as the contractor program so honestly if that's all you get out of today that's probably quite valuable like I've, it's the amount of times contractors are driving back to 40 minutes back to a property because the clients touch something um, the great thing about Wi-Fi enabled controllers now is that you can do that from your phone and that you could actually be the parent across 60 controllers and all of your clients can't change anything without putting a pin in that you obviously give them and then you can prove that they've made a change and then you can charge $80 or $100 to go out and fix it and be like what I told you Rainbird don't come as a well actually either to hunt and out the, they come as a bare non-Wi-Fi enabled controller and you can add a Wi-Fi dongle to them so in some cases you're going to find uh, especially if you're doing work for uh, developers and everything comes down to the last 40 cents they might be happy to put the Rainbird controller in but they're not putting a Wi-Fi dongle in because it's an extra $120 that they haven't factored into their $199,900 property you can leave that out and then they can put it in later so there's an accessory port here I'm pretty sure this one's got one on the side yeah the wand yeah so it goes in there so you can buy them a good controller you can have an option on your quote for a Wi-Fi connectivity they can choose to pay the extra money or not um, if they obviously don't have the Wi-Fi connectivity you don't have that ability to help them from your lounge room on a Sunday when they're messing around with their controller because their mates are around watching the footy so I don't think I've got any here but that's controllers the irrigation controllers are all a 240 volt transformed down to 24 volt AC they communicate via the, these cables very small cable this is half mil squared the any job you're doing and I'm, without generalizing until you get to commercial work you're only going to be using half mil squared I'll pass some around because it looks like you guys are keen to start doing some stuff getting a bit tired I hate I, I used to hate sitting and listening to someone talk for an hour so I get it so this is the cable well this is an example of cable did you prepare enough for everyone you might have to share sorry so this is what three core you can cut some up and you can all share so half milled square half mil squared cable is uh, thick enough for half mil squared is thick enough for you to run a communication or for the electricity to get through 120 meters so if you've got a controller does anyone want more cable like I don't know if, if anyone's missing out mud will cut you some but everyone's cool you can share all right so with with that cable you can run that about 120 meters before you start to get a voltage drop that's going to stop a solenoid valve from opening so 24 uh, sorry 240 volts goes in transformer then converts that to 24 volt alternating current that's what's going through those cables it comes out to these solenoid valves sends an electrical pulse through those two cables electromagnetically lifts a pin in here changes the pressure in here pops water through it and it opens so your you need that cable to get the electricity from the controller to the solenoid valve with enough voltage to lift that pin so when you start having issues where the pin's not lifting because you're trying to run half mil cable 150 meters because you're on a commercial site and your boss is trying to save some money because we underquoted it and just stick the half mil in it'll be fine it's not going to be again there's data behind this voltage drop is a thing same with flow loss that's the reason we use certain size pipes that's the reason why when we put 25 mil in for a, a big system for your um, for these lines don't drop it back to 19 mil to save money or because you had it in your tray without talking to the irrigation shop there could be a reason they, they might have put 25 mil in because they felt like it but they might have put 25 mil in because it was the right size pipe to handle the velocity of the water for the sprinklers same with cable don't cut corners on cable there's so many other things you could do better off removing that row of sprinklers than trying to cut your cable down so cable tap timers we talked about tap timers um, I might do some troubleshooting around valves then I'm going to get you to do some wire joins 
some blue line joins, some cobra clamps, and take some solenoid valves apart and have a play with that. Then we'll go outside and build a system and pop it up. So we'll probably have a break in 10 minutes so you can get some more waters and have a durry if you need to. So the solenoid valves, this, I'll just go through this troubleshooting because I think it's really important. Most of the time, um, you're only gonna have issues uh, with solenoid valves. If anything goes wrong on a system, it's either my system's not turning on, my system's not turning off. You don't get a lot of calls for the sprinklers kind of like five degrees off where it was meant to be or it's, it's a lot around solenoid valves. You obviously saw me take this valve apart. So I'll talk about what could cause different things and then we'll move into the construct or the building of stuff. So two things, my valve won't open and my valve won't close. Let's see if this works. Oh, good. Can anyone tell me a reason why a solenoid valve wouldn't turn on or wouldn't open? Where's that coming from? Faulty connections. So the wire. Yep. So if this here isn't joint correctly to that, it won't turn on, right? So the controller needs to have the common cable, which we use as black, and then one, two, three, and four, you'll work down your cables. So if, and that could be because the wire join you did didn't work. We've had issues with these large wire joiners not crimping those small cables to these medium cables. So a lot of the solenoid valves have a slightly larger diameter cable to the cable that you're holding in your hand. And so these wire joiners are designed to be able to just crush around and then there's teeth in them that will slide around the cable. And the theory is that you don't need to pull any of that plastic sheath off. You've done yours. Yeah, so if you have a look here, like he's pulled it back, we would sheath these that like cut that plastic end off like you'd see electricians do. Um, and then we twist the wires together and stick them in these. If you don't do that, if you choose to just stick them in, they'd all need to be the same size. You put one in each hole and crush the wire joint. You can take that apart and put it back together. If you have a look inside these wire joiners, there's those metal bits in there. I'll get you to actually use some. Have you guys used these before? Is anyone, is this all new? Yep, no, no, yep, good. I'm hoping you haven't because I actually want to teach you something. No worries. Oh, sucked in, you don't get one. <laughs> so, if the, there'll be times when you've crushed that wire, so you've stuck all your wires in there and crushed it. You didn't get one. Marge. That's your fault. Uh, get us three, three one fours, please. So they're a larger wire joiner. Majority of the, there's really small ones that we sell as well, which you can buy. They're just, you can't quite get the wires in there. People use them if they want to save money. I've only, I always just used to use these. They're big, they're there. The idea with the wire joint is that you have a completely waterproof wire joint. So when you put all these cables in, and we'll do that in a sec, you'll crush, so you'll put it inside the wire joiner. You can use obviously multi-grips or pliers for this. What I usually do is stick all the wires in one end and have it, have it holding like that so I can see the cables. And I'll push all the wires in and I can see that they've all gone to the back and then I'll crush it through that clear side. So you just squeeze that. You can reuse these if you get stuck. It's not great, but if you are on site and you need to get out of there and there's some, and you've done one and it didn't quite work, like what I used to do is pull them all once I did it. And if one came out, obviously it hasn't grabbed it. Then I'd squeeze the side of that. It pops that wire joiner back out. You might want to put some more silicon in there and then you can reuse it. It's not ideal, but you can get away with it if you get stuck. The idea is to just take enough of the plastic off of that wire to get the wire into that join twisted together and all connected and, and getting a grab by the metal, but not so much that there's still metal hanging out the other side of that wire joiner. So when you squeeze that wire joiner closed, there'll be a gel that'll push out and I'll get you to do this. That gel needs to be completely past any metal because obviously you're only, what's that? Past the copper, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's right, because then it's sitting in a valve box which is underground in a system that delivers water. Like it's, it's everything that could go wrong is there. So, um, all righty. This is going to take, look at your initiative. This is beautiful. The, so, yeah, wire join not done properly. 
If electricity can't get to that valve, it's not going to open. Uh, you might find that the wire joins fine and the copper has been damaged further down the track by a rogue spade or shovel or dog or rat or mouse or whatever. Um, once you start troubleshooting that, it's, it's going to be a real challenge. If the valve's not turning on, is that what we're talking Yeah, not turning on, and it's not at the wire join, it's in that 20 metres of cable that's through the roof under the pavers. Like it's, it's either evaluate whether or not you completely replace that piece of cable and just be done with it, or, or actually find it and work backwards, or cut it halfway, and well, you know that's not even going to work. So it's, it's going to be, or use a multimeter, yeah. So the majority of the irrigation, irrigation techs aren't going to have that, um, I guess, knowledge. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know, I wouldn't be able, so what are you saying, as in send electricity and work out where it stops? You can just go to the valve or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, and see if there's a break in the cable. Then, well, I guess you couldn't use that to then find where the break is, though, could you? No. I think there's some tools. If it's the cable, it's not something else. That's a good point. I think there are some tools where you can... Dig it up or whatever. Or replace it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you can use a multimeter. What was your name, sorry? Philip was just saying you can use a multimeter, send current down the cable, sorry, back from the cable and see if it's actually the cable, so remove it from the, the solenoid valve and test the cable that way um, and then make a decision around how you're going to handle it. Other reasons a valve might not turn on? The coil or the, or the diaphragm, yep. So I talked before about how these work. It sends an electrical current through here, which has got an electromagnetic pin that lifts up, and there's a rubber diaphragm in there that pops. If either of those are faulty, the valve may not turn on. Uh, that's, again, you could do, use a multimeter to test the coil. Um, most of the time, if, there's a, if, you're, if you've got electricity flowing through because you've turned the controller on, you can feel or hear the coil buzzing. Um, if the coil's buzzing, it's generally okay then it'll be a case of there's a debris issue with the solenoid valve or the diaphragm's damaged. Uh, usually what I'd do, and this whole troubleshooting process, when you've got issues, you wanna try and find the quickest way to get out of there. So you're trying to do the least amount of cutting and removing. So you'd be, you're looking to see, can, like, can I take that coil out? So the coil's the bit that's screwed into there. Can I take that coil out and see if there's any debris in here? The smallest amount of debris in there can stop that from actually changing, like there's a little hole there that that blocks and it stops it from, from popping. This is a bleed screw. So the idea with a, with a, with a solenoid valve, electricity sends, uh, electricity pops this open. If the electrical side of it's not working for some reason, you can actually turn this a quarter turn and it will simulate what the electricity was doing and the valve should turn on. If it does that manually, you can eliminate the fact that the, the diaphragm's the problem because the actual, the manual part of the valve's working and then it's, you've narrowed it down to the coil isn't the thing that's working. So you try and go through those troubleshooting processes by just like taking that apart and having a look at it. Obviously, if the ball valve's still on, water's gonna squirt out of here. The last thing that will stop the valve from turning on is no water. So if the water's been turned off at the ball valve because Again, your client thought it would be nice to help you out and turn that off. Um, you can spend 40 minutes walking around trying to work out what's going on, and it's that. And that's it. So that's a valve not turning on. Um, then the other option, the, the, and a valve not turning on is going to be a problem when they call you and say everything's dead. Like, it's, you're not generally going to know, unless they're kind of conscious of their sprinklers popping up and they like to sit out there and watch them, they're not going to say anything, especially with drip tube. There's not a lot... You, can't, you can only sometimes hear it squealing when it turns on, but you're not going to know that it's working. You will get a phone call for a valve not turning off. So can anyone tell me why a valve might not turn off? Yep. So generally the, the valve's broken or the controller is telling it not to turn off. So you will get phone calls from a client saying my valve's not turned off and they've turned the controller to an eight hour runtime, seven days a week, twice a day, and it's being told to turn on. So if, the, if it's, it's either gonna be the controller's telling the valve to turn on or the valve's broken. So it's either a, a torn diaphragm. So where's the diaphragm? Uh, 
um, or there's a rock or some debris stuck in the valve. A lot of times when a valve won't turn off, it's not that it won't turn off, it's that it won't turn off fully and there's something stuck under there. A lot of times when that happens, dirt, if a rock or something gets in here, it'll hold it from closing. And it's not uncommon for that to happen after uh, all water or SA, is it all water? Yeah, they fix the pipes. If they've just done some pipe repair work out the front of the property and they've got some rubble or something in the actual pipe and it's got managed to get through your water meter, or if you've had a landscaper or a irrigator do some work and they've got some stuff in the main line, it'll usually be the last solenoid valve on the bank. They'll turn it on and it will blow the rubble into there and it'll get stuck at this point and that's when the valve won't turn off. So it's really easy to take the valve apart. We'll do that in a sec. I'm just conscious of time. So let's first do some wire joins. Um, how are we going to do this? <sighs> Who's done this before? You've done it. You don't need to do this. Do you want to do it? Well, we're here to learn. We're here to learn. I just want to see how many valves I need. So I might just get you to cut your wire to sheath off the ends of your wires. I'll get you some tools. There's one. We'll have to share them. I only had four. We're doing this on a budget. Oh, when I stole them off the guys, they were like, who, well, hang on, who's, are these coming out of stock? <laughs> so, no, you only got one to share. Pass them around. So just sheath off the ends. Did you get one? You didn't get one. Um, so if you can just take off, say, um, about... 15 mil of the end. Um, I really need more wire joiners. We bought more on eBay, but they didn't get here in time. We'll try to be as quick as we can. So if you haven't used one of those tools before, you used it before? All right, so these, they've got all different sizes. So we open it up. Is it locked? Yeah, on this side. And then you're gonna find the hole that suits and kind of turn it like that and you get your wire, but you, you, you'll need more than that. So the red, it's not a big deal to take too much of the red off. You just don't want to take too much of the, the others off, and I just destroyed that. So you don't want to be biting, yeah. see how we've pierced that, because yeah. that's going to cause a problem. So there's probably better people here than me to show you how to do this, but that's the gist of it. And then you want to find the, the smaller yeah. of them and pull that off. There's heaps, so you do the, I'll cut that off so you can do it probably. <laughs> now there's a lot of different um, tools that you can use for uh, uh, wire stripping. This is definitely not the best one, but it would be the cheapest. Um, don't use your teeth. <laughs> <coughs> Who did? You. Yeah. Uh, but you can get some really cool wire joint, like wire um, tools that um, you want to have a Novice, That's all right. So. I'm not, and I just destroyed that. So uh, you want to find the hole. So everyone, you want to try and find a hole that's most appropriate for the for the cable. This is not ideal because there's not um, not one of them actually fits it perfectly. So I went to that one and just kind of did that, and then pulled the the cable off. The, the thing you want to be careful of is you don't want to go through the red and get the yeah. the others because then you've exposed that metal, and then you're pulling these off and then finding which one of these. So they'll actually say on there, there's one that says half mil. So these are half mil. Yeah, you bring your own tools next time. <laughs> yeah, and that's it. So yeah, have a shot. Has everyone got it? Like, I did a really shit job, so please don't feel bad if you, you got yours. I'm not doing it. I did that with my second. You got it? Oh, you haven't even got a tool. No, I'm just talking about teeth. Yeah. You know you've probably got some of the youngest teeth here. You want to protect them, man. You've got a long time. You need those teeth. Maybe. Or you're just going to get grills at some point. Yeah, probably. Cool. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be right. You have it. Yeah, irrigation grills. Yeah. Just have a half mil gap for the wires. Does anyone else need the tool? You guys got it? You worked it out? You need the tool? I think he's done pretty well. So, what I would do if I'm using these cables is take it back, like I said, to that kind of 
a centimetre of, of copper. Uh, and then I'll just draw a wiring diagram up here. So for these solenoid valves here, we're going to have two solenoid valves in the ground. Obviously they've got uh, two wires coming out the top of them. No red. What's going on here? I just expected more from you guys. Uh, so there'll be two cables coming out the top of each solenoid valve. Solenoid valves that operate from a, two, a 24 volt controller have an alternating current, so the colours don't matter. That's why they're both red. When you're looking at battery operated solenoid valves like the Hunter Node, you'll have a, a black and a red. The polarity matters. You have to put black with black and red with red, otherwise it won't work properly. What'd she say? They're not mine. They're shit ones. I'm not doing this anymore. All right, uh, so I said before about the importance of using black as a common. It's an industry standard in Australia for black to be the common. It makes it much easier for people when they're going back and they might even be in your team when they're troubleshooting a controller to know that the cables in the valve box that the black one is the common and the black should be wired up to all the solenoid valves. So they're the two valves. Then you'll have a controller with a common. One, two, three, four, they're all ports. They're here. Common, one, two, three, and four. These valves have only got cable going into the common and one and two. The, this has got the black into the common and then yellow into one and white into two. I would have done the white first and the yellow Second, I always used to do my cable in alphabetical order. There's no standard around that. It's just something I did so that I knew that there was blue, then brown, then the colors went on. So I could know that solenoid valve one is this valve, solenoid valve two is this valve. So what, once we get those wires exposed in a solenoid valve situation like this, the black one that's coming out of yours will get wired up to one of each of the cables. So we've got two different brands here. We've grabbed one of the wires from valve one, one of the wires from valve two. We sheath them, twist them, join them to the black cable that's coming from the controller and that's your common taken care of. And then the other two cables go to valve one and valve two. So common goes to two of them. And then one goes to one. And the other one goes to the other one. And that just goes like that until you run out of cable and valves. Cable comes as a three core, five core, seven core, nine core, 13 core. There's always one for the common and then obviously the rest are for your actives. Questions? Nope. All right. So you've all got some wire joiners. So if you put your cable into your wire joiners, obviously you've got these and so if you've got your two, if you've got these smaller cables here, if you just, right. that's all right. Well, you didn't have any tools, did you? Up, uh, yeah. We need more wire joiners for the next training session. <laughs> wire joiners, sorry, wire cutters, I'm, yeah. Oh God, I just messed that up real bad. Anyway, so just, <laughs> In the interest of moving forward and getting everything done, if you can stick, um, say, two of your cables into the into the wire joiner or three of your cables into the wire joiner, and then I'll give you some um, multi grips to crush it down, just so you feel what it feels like, and then see if you can pull them back out. Like you'll see these because they're quite a small wire, um, without twisting those cables. So you've got uh, exposed cables there. Yes, I pulled that one out too much. <laughs> That's right. So without twisting those together, you're not going to get the same bite. So that can go in all the way there. So you can see cable. So the, the metal that does the joins that spine. So as long as you've got the copper coming past that, you're going to be fine. And then, so if you just want to grab that and you, you're going to just crush that. So you want to be holding the wire joiner with the tool and then 
make sure you can see the copper. So I'm, I'm grabbing it like that, pushing that in so that I can see it. That's a really bad example. And then crushing it. Oops, I used your wire joiner. So yeah, um, and then you shouldn't be able to pull the, the cable back out. So do you want to have a shot? Where'd it go? It so, I mean, you can cut these. I'll get you some putters. So, I haven't done a hands-on training session like this before, so um, I apologise if this is going a bit south, but I just want to make sure you have a gist of how this works, and if you want, we can do some... Like, if anyone wants to do some actual proper wire joins afterwards, we can. So, just get them in like that. So, if you... You would have sheathed these, yeah. right? But for the purpose of this... And we would um, be twisting yep. together the black yep. and whichever one. I would twist all three together and get them in there. It's, it's probably not exactly the right way from an electrical standpoint. Um, it's how I've always done it. Anytime I've gone out and find, found issues with valves not turning on with these wire joints, it's because they've done exactly what I've just done. Crushed it, so you can have a shot at that. So you want to hold... You could solder these as well. So you want to hold that. So you've got that wire join and push them in and then crush it. So just make sure they're in as far as possible. And you, you'll know you'll, the blue will be flat into the join. You want some wire strippers? I keep leave, letting everyone down. We'll buy more for next time. You can come back, it'll be wicked, it'll be heaps better. So you guys got wire strippers, you just need multi-groups. All good? Perfect. Got the gist of it. Did you not have a wire joiner? They let you down. That's your fault. Sorry, he looked at more. <laughs> can he have one? So yeah, you should be able to pull, like you can't get that out, like it's, and, and if you can pull each individual one, what's that? So will that still work, because I didn't twist them. That, that's fine, so you've got purchase there, okay. like they're all there. Yep. The risk is that the, the white or the yellow or the black, if you don't sheath it back, those metal blades slide around it, and they're, the wire, these small wires are so small, sometimes they won't actually make a connection, so that's why we do it. Yeah, I would twist them for that purpose. The, the main, the, I think the main issue is that you're using these, these are quite a thick wire. Like if you have a look at the, the plastic on these, compared to the plastic you're dealing with, there's a massive difference. Oh, yeah. And so what will happen is it'll pierce the big cable hmm. and it won't pierce the little ones. So you almost need two small ports and a large port and then it works. So I've twisted them together. If you go to a smaller wire joiner to accommodate the smaller cables, the big cable won't fit in there. So, um, if you really want to make sure that you're actually like you really kill it, that's the, what a normal the size of the. Okay. Is that where the is it the centre part? Yep. That's where the that's the, 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 that there those teeth. They that's what slides over and pierces it. That's what I've been working off of. Yep. Just so as long as it's past that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you guys are done. Yeah. Yep. So. You could, you could twist them all together, solder them together and put a heat shrink cap on it and it, there's, there's no, I guess, there's no wrong way. Not doing it at all is probably the wrong way. Let's have a quick chat about yep. this. So, um, it's, we, I think we've, we've yep, done That's all good, but you can't pull it out. But if we were actually rigging this up with two systems, two solenoids, yep. it would be um, one cable going to the controller, like this whole cable. So that, that black one there, would go into this joiner, yep. and one of each of those cable, one of each from that valve would go in here with the black. So, so you, you could like split it back; it would be black. black, and then one of the valves, the other valve. And if you had four valves, all four would have a cable each in this hole. So you'd squeeze two in that hole, two in that hole, and then the black, because you need to send electricity to every valve. And then at the at the other that's back at the controller. That's when you would go. Yeah. So this piece, so that's your valves. Yeah. That's wired into port one and port two, and the black would be in the common. So you can come come and have a look at this. So they've wired them in exactly as your as we just talked about. So you've got the black into the common. Yeah. They're all nicely tight. Yeah. Those then would go black would go to that and that. Yeah. And then they'd go to white and yellow. Yeah. And that's it. Electricity creates a circuit. It sends out electricity through C and one and pops that. Yeah. Then C and two and pops that. And these are obviously two different types. Yeah, of it's just a rainbird and a hunter valve just to show you. So um, at both of them. 
both these cables are the same? Like they're... The, because it's alternating current, they both are exactly the same. You could put that into the common or that into the common, yeah. but you can't put both of those into the common. It's one of each, one from so each you'd have, Yeah, one, one of these in with the black yep. and the other one... Would go to whatever colour you wanted it to. So yeah. if it's yellow or white or whatever. And that would be a different, uh, in a different hole in the... Yeah, that would just be a separate wire thing. joiner. So you'd have yep. a joiner for your common, a joiner for one and a joiner for two. Yep. So three joiners for that system. Obviously, if you've got 10 or 12 solenoid valves, you'll find that making a common becomes quite complicated because you'll bridge off of the black with two more blacks or three more blacks. And then one will go into a joiner with three, the other will go into the joiner with four, the other will go into a joiner with four so that you can get your common out to all your valves. But then there's only ever one to one for your active. Finding a diagram for this would be easy. Yeah. Oh, mate, if you, yeah, like it, it's a wiring diagram. I mean, that's a very shit version of it, but black to everything, and that just goes forever. Yep. I'll write that down and I'll get you something. No, we've got heaps and why would you want more wire joiners? Just put your um, contact details on there for me. Lisa, are we doing a door prize? Alright, so I'm conscious of time, let's do so you've done wire joiners, I want to do some cobra clamps up. So, the two ways you can clamp poly is with either a plastic, oh do you want to have a break? Does anyone need to stop and just like go do shit or you keep moving? Keep moving, then you can go home earlier? Sweet, alright. If you want drinks, help yourself. I'll, I'll see if I can find this thing. Yeah. So, um, I've just got a bunch of poly here, we'll cut it in half and then join it back together with tees and elbows and I'll get you to use the plastic clips and the metal clips. Uh, I'm assuming most of you have probably used metal, uh, sorry, plastic, plastic clamps before. Like these. Yep. The, the clamps that we stock at all of our locations are made by Antelco. Antelco manufacture these in St Agnes now on Tolly Road. They used to make them in Murray Bridge. We do not stock any poly fittings that are made offshore. Uh, most of the tees and elbows and clips are all made in SA or at St Agnes. If, if we can't get them from them, then we buy them from HR that make it Royal Park or Filmac that make, like a lot of stuff's made here in South Australia. All of the poly's made in SA. The poly pipe's actually made next door at DM Plastics. So very low carbon footprint, well, to this point, but. Not much. Um, they can't really. They can shandy a little bit into to the pipe, like if they have a if they make a bad batch of pipe, they might grind it back up and mix it back in with with the pipe. They just it's too inconsistent um, for this kind of a product because of the the fact that it has to have a, a pressure rating of such. Um, I actually went and met the owner of Adelaide Plastic Recyclers the other day. He, he's making rainwater tanks and um, you know those like plastic bollards and the bin things, and they they can only really use them in like the the recycled plastics in those products because they don't have a pressure rating as such like this. Yeah. The problem is it's just as expensive, like their cost... The recyclability of them after, so you're pulling out a of this, yeah. I'm, I've nev I haven't found anything perfect yet. I think that there are people taking plastic now yeah. and grinding it down and, re and then selling it as pellet pelletized plastic to make other things. Um, I've seen recycled plastic in stormwater pipe and it's not pretty. Like it becomes mottled and you could like, if you step on it, it just, it's like a biscuit. So I don't know that the technology is there yet. Um, and I think until government makes it financially beneficial for private enterprise to do more of it, people aren't gonna do it. So um, they'll use recycled sometimes, but to buy like virgin poly, I don't think costs any different than buying recycled chips. It's around either government grants or someone's desire to be a better world and they're going down that path. But. Some of this might have recycled plastic in it. The drip tube we've got here is made in Victoria. Netafim make this. Netafim are the gold standard for drip tube in the world. We do buy Toro drip tube as well, which is made in Beverly. It's just, it's not the same technology. Um, so anyway, I'll pass out some plastic clips and we'll do some joins and I'll pass out some Cobra clips. The Cobra clips are a stainless steel clamp that are made in Germany, I think. Um, they're, I guess, the gold standard for clips. We've tried to use um, oh, hippo clamps. Probably should have given out some pipe while I was walking, eh? So 
So I'll just give you out some pipe. I'll get you to cut it in half and then join it back together with the joiner that I'm going to give you as well. Marge, can you get me some joiners, some 13 mil joiners, please? Yep. So I'm sorry if this seems like really basic stuff. I just want to make sure that you're doing the joints properly. So you can cut poly and drip tube with secateurs, you can cut it with uh, a hacksaw, you can cut it with a Stanley knife, you can pretty much cut it however you want. We use cutters like these. Uh, these cutters will cut, uh, in a lot of cases, the cable that you're using, the PVC that you're using. Uh, the process is to stick the, the pipe in there and give the blade a twist when, you, when you're cutting it and you'll get a nice clean cut. The cleaner the cut, the better. If you want to cut yours in half, and then you can join the other half to it. Now again, I've only got four of these Cobra tools, so I'll get you to do a Cobra. So if you, yeah, have you used this before? All right, so the Cobra clamps are a preferred option commercially now. The cost of a Cobra clamp is probably three or four times the cost of a plastic clamp. Once these are on, they are on. Like they are not coming off, they're not UV unstable, they're not, um, I mean the plastic clamps we stock are the best that you can get, but they're still gonna get brittle in 15 years or if you kick it hard enough, it's gonna come off. These are really hard to get off. So same process that you've done there, you've got that in the right spot. So you guys probably can't see it as well, but the clips just behind the barb, the cut's straight, you grab the clip, and just crush it like that. So that's done. Now that you'll see with the plastic clamps, you can still turn them. The metal clamps are so tight, they're not going anywhere. Oh, I mean, they might. You, you'll struggle to, it's not gonna beat the plastic clamp. Now the metal clamps, once you put them on, you can actually take them off. So you put the teeth in the side and that clamps come off and you can just keep taking it on and off and on and off and on and off. So I'll let you have a shot with that. So you've got your plastic clip. Yeah, smashed it. Smashed it. And he's done that before. Now that's that can get tighter. Like that's not. Yeah. Yeah. I do a bit of hands. Yeah. You didn't want to break it. So it, it's funny. Like that still feels loose-ish, but that there. Have you ever used these before? Yeah. Yeah. So you're grabbing it. <laughs> there and there. Yeah. As in, what have you been doing these up with? Just um, <laughs> figuring it out with them or... Um, what do we use? Oh, we use Whatever. Um, like wire the snips that look the same, but... That ain't working. What do you need? Cobra tools? No. Is that designed to help you push? No. Yeah. It's designed to clear the hole when you punch it. So I just made up that use for it. You put that on the internet. There you go. <laughs> we'll all use it now. So then you can actually take that off by getting those teeth into the side and doing that. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. It makes a lot more easier. Have a shot. It's like me trying to reopen. I've never reopened. I always just cut off and just do it again. Look, it's if you That's get stuck. Why yeah. Uh, what else have we got? Tools. So this is going on here. Grabbing that, making sure it's behind the barb, not there, there you go. And that's it. And then you can actually take it apart by getting those those teeth. They kind of go into the, like that. They were before. Is there any benefit to using these over the plastic clips? They'll never come off, ever. Like, I can't even get it off with the tool. <laughs> Um, they cost more, so the idea is that those teeth go into those holes, there we go. And then if you haven't fucked the clip up, which I probably have, you can just do it back up. So have a play with that, I'll give you another one. Um, these here, what you want to be doing is making sure that you're levelling that off. And don't be afraid to, I mean that probably has another clip, another. You sh these shouldn't break, right? Like if you're breaking them, they're probably not made in SA. Like this, the pla these plastic, you should not break. Um, where would you buy them from usually? 
So not from here, or like not 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 traditionally, because if they've come from a hardware shop or like as Reese bring theirs in from South Africa, they're made like or Taiwan, I think they're made. They shouldn't ever break. You should be able to flex that clip like right back on itself. Yeah, grab some more 13 mil clips and some covers. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, who's not done it? Yep, you need a bit of a lesson. Oh, you got all the tools. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Cobra clamp. Like that. That's done. So you're just showing us the two different options there. Yeah. Don't use these together. I had actually, it's funny, one of my counter sales guys sold a system last week. Daryl, he's only been working, what, two months? He saw someone using one on a 19 mil and someone using the Cobra on a 13. So he sold a system where there was plastic on the 19 branch and 13 on the, and metal on the 13. He just didn't know. Um, I was asked before what the advantage of these metal clips are. You will never, ever, ever go back to a metal clip, ever. Like it's, it, once that's on, that's on. Like it's not coming off. Well, plastic can get brittle. If you use these plastic clips, like if I was still installing, I'd be using plastic clips. There's no issue with it. Um, there, but there's, I guess that oils ain't oils situation. Like there's plastic clips that are made in Taiwan or China from different plastics, um, South Africa, it's not just, but these are made here. If you get a clip that hasn't been done up, you can bend them almost back on themselves without snapping. Like, and I, like right now, that clip, you try getting a clip like that, like another brand, I'll probably break it now, and undoing it with your multi-grips, like that. So that, I've undone that, go put it back on. There is no way, this is Antel, a big, massive ad for Antelco, you would not be able to do that with any other clip. Okay. The plastic that they use is so good. Yeah. So you, and then the metal, you can take them apart by sticking the, um, the teeth in there. And so you, are all metal clips pretty much on par with each other? No, these are Cobra clips. These are, this is the, the Esky or the Coke or whatever. What's that? I, I, honestly, I'd use plastic, no issue. We, it's, it's like, so the clips in your hand, the plastic clip's probably 15 cents and the metal clip's probably 60 or 70 cents. And so a box of 100, which, when, especially when you've got potentially staff that give a lot less of a shit about money than you and they're tipping them out or they're leaving them or they're, they're leaving them on site or whatever. If I was doing a job in Williamstown or Wyala, I'd probably go stainless steel cobra clamps just so that I know that I'm not going back for a clip. But these are really good clips. I'm not trying to sell you away from them. I'm just trying to highlight what the options are. Uh, who hasn't had the tool or the clip? You want to play with the tool? All right. Well, look, see, these guys are trying to help you out. They got all the cobras. Yeah, we got all the stuff. No questions? Makes sense? Yeah. All right, so you, you guys have put a clamp on. All right, so well, you got cutters. So did you tell us to put this on before? Oh yeah, I didn't cover that. Oh. <laughs> Very handy. He's gonna get some kind of Mars bar or something. So the, with the Cobra clamp, try to slide it onto the pipe before you put the pipe onto the fitting. Bending them out and bending them back in doesn't work very well and you'll find that you'll never get it quite the same. So if you've got a T and you've got all three areas, I'd slide all the Cobras back down the T, stick them all on and then slide them in and clip them up. The plastic clips, you can flex them right out. And so, when you cut, as actually while I'm there, when you're cutting next to a dripper, don't cut next to a dripper. Try to go back three centimeters. The drippers flare a little bit, and you might get, you're not going to get a clean join. And obviously, turn that. Plus, your fitting's not going to go into the hole if there's a dripper. So, ideally, slide that on, push that on, do that up. Where's the tool? What's the cost of the Cobra tool? 40 bucks now maybe, like they used to be really bad. You can actually undo that Cobra. And you do twist it a little bit. Too. I am, I, I wasn't with all of them. Some, uh, I gave that one a bit of a range. Some of them I've been having good luck, with, good luck with and some not. Yeah, there you go, and then you can do that back up. Same with that, you could pop that out, like probably with your fingers and redo it. Like a, a hardware shop clip, you are not gonna be able to do that. Yeah. So, they're your sonnies, I was about to grab them. Hey, they're my sonnies. How much are the tools? I said about 40, I think they're yeah. around that. Um, they used to be like 70. I think someone, they might be Cobra brand. I think someone's brought out a rip-off that's cheaper. I think we've got both. Yeah. Um, 
very much a Jared or Brandon question than a Clint question, but I'll find out for you. You've had a shot. Have you had a shot, or you've been left here? I'm still waiting. Sitting at the back of the bus. Yeah. All right. We just need cutters. That's all. Cutters or fog cutters? That's not going to work. Much for a bag of those cobra clips. So what I was saying before, you might be looking at 15 cents trade for that, and 60 or 70 cents for that. So it's up there, and that's the thing. Like, is that four times better than that? Yeah. Like, I don't, know, I don't think so. Efficiency-wise, it's probably a little. Well, it doesn't stick up either. Like, so if you've got a, sorry, you've got like a, a concrete haunch or something, you've got a lot, you know, even grow walls, like if you're doing a green wall, those clamps fit down the green, you can slide the pipe down. That's not what I was looking for. You're all good, you got yours? Yep. You already done that? There you go, so you cut that in half. Yep. Was I meant to put one of these in here? That's right. I can do it. Yeah, you've got muscles, you're stronger than me, mate. I'm an office bitch now. Uh, the reason for the caps is just in case they might have had low pressure. That's a oh, yeah, cool. Also, <laughs> Yep. All right, so uh, that's... Any questions around clips? I honestly did not think that there would be as much to do... Like, that seems like something we really, need, like, really needed to do. I was surprised by... Um, the fact that you guys probably haven't been exposed to Cobra clamps. Um, some of the questions I covered off, they're probably four times the price. Um, I don't necessarily think you have to use them. I'd say if you were doing regional work, I would use them. If you're doing commercial projects, a lot of times they're being specified now, so you'll see them in the specs, so make sure you're quoting for them. Um, if you are going to use plastic clips, try to buy something that's of a good quality. I showed some of you down there. You can, you can flex those 13 mil clips right back on themselves and they won't break. You do that, go to Bunnings and do that with a Pope clip, you'll snap it in half. Uh, so that's clips. Any questions about that? We stocked them in 13, 19, 25 and 32. So no difference, just bigger. The tools, I'll get an exact price, but I think they're around 40 bucks. They're probably 70 and I'll probably have to sell them to you for 40 now, but um, yeah. I think they make a cheaper tool that will close them but not reopen them, that doesn't have the teeth. Yeah, um, Toro brought out hippo clamps about four or five years ago as a, like, they saw an opportunity to try and come in and take that market because Cobra, that's massive. Like, we buy pallets of those clips and they didn't have that, the, their tooling weren't able to reopen and they were quite soft and they didn't, yeah. The coloured ones? Yeah. So that's clips. Adam just highlighted that it was probably a good idea for me to talk quickly about the, the order of all this and why it exists. I didn't talk about pressure reduction. This is a pressure reducer here. Pressure reducers need to go after a solenoid valve. They're not rated to hold mains pressure, so they can only hold um, dynamic pressure as it's passing through. That there is designed to drop the pressure for this drip tube so that the drip tube's operating e uh, efficiently or effectively. Drip tube and sprinklers have different pressure ratings that they operate best at. So if a uh, drip tube, for example, would want to be in that 170 to 210 kPa at the dripper, most of the time, like I talked to you about with the pressure up on the board before, a, a house these days has 500 kPa going in. If you get 500 kPa going into the dripper, the dripper's not going to deliver the amount of water that it's meant to. I talked earlier about how drip tube has that um, 1.6 litres per hour. Sprinklers have their 10 or 11 mil an hour. All of that only works when the right amount of pressure is going into the system. These sprinklers aren't on a pressure reducer. If you were having issues adjusting the angle or the or the distance that an MP rotator throws, most cases it's because there's too much pressure coming in. That's when you can look at putting a pressure reducer into the system. You can either put a pressure reducer like that in line. There are products that can screw between the coil and the valve. So you can unscrew this coil and stick an AccuSync in there and that will reduce the pressure at the valve level. So you don't have to dig up and try and retrofit into here. This is pro that's probably more advanced irrigation. That's what we would cover. And you can buy sprinkler bodies with a pressure regulating shaft. So it's actually in the sprinkler. You can only get them in a four inch pop-up. So they're quite, it's a bigger trench to be digging, um, but you could put them in and that'll regulate the pressure at the sprinkler. That's the best technology because you can have a pressure reducer here and it has to, and then it goes through 20 meters of pipe. You've actually lost more pressure through the pipe. Residentially, I don't think you guys are ever gonna have to take into consideration that that pressure reducer needs to be higher than it's meant to be because it's then going through 100 metres of pipe before it gets to the, to the drip tube, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Up here, we've got the ball valve and the backflow in that 
configuration, it doesn't matter if it was the other way around. Uh, that's going to be a decision for you to make on site. Obviously, you're trying to get valve boxes over things. Um, if this was my, if I was doing this job, I would have had the bull valve and the um, and the dual check up the side and then elbowed in and have the bull valve in a configuration that I could still turn the handle on and off without touching the, the valve box. So that's it. I want to get you guys outside and put a system together. So the solenoid valves, we'll do that later if we need to. I've got some drills here. If you want to open the solenoid valve, if you haven't done it before, we'll do that after we've done that. Um, if you want to go outside, you want to pop that roller door, we'll get a manifold together. Um, so anyone that, I guess, we're gonna build what we've just talked about. We're gonna build that outside. If you don't feel like you need to be here for that, don't feel like you have to stay just because you've signed up for the two hour course and it's an hour 35. You're welcome to go have some Subway, grab a drink and bounce. But if you wanna be part of that, I, obviously a lot of it's gonna be standing around watching because I can't have you all putting it together, but um, we'll go do that. Here, I think the majority of what we would need to build what we had out there. Uh, this is a very uh, basic configuration uh, that, you, that you might see set up that you might do. So we talked about doing a flow versus pressure test before. In a lot of cases, you're going to go to a property and you're going to find that there's a garden tap in the, in the wall and it might be the only place you can get water from. So there's a few ways you can do this. You can get water from a, um, a plumber coming and actually tapping the mains and giving you a bull valve to work to like this. This was all performed by a licensed plumber, obviously. Um, they came and took the tap off and put a T here and a bull valve. We haven't dealt with any backflow prevention. That's live, I hope. Yep. So I'm going to show you. So obviously Gripset sponsored this segment. Uh, that's a 20 litre bucket. So what you would do when you're testing your water, uh, your pressure versus flow, sorry, your flow test with a bucket is you need to have the valve completely open before you stick the bucket under there and then time it. So I'd have a timer ready and it'd be going like that. And then timing how long that takes to fill up. We obviously know that this is a 20 litre bucket. Most of the time you're gonna have a 10 litre bucket. You like that? You'll be able to use that for something, won't you? That's awesome, thanks. Uh, so then you would do that at the front and the back of a house. So if you're doing, um, if you're coming in to get an irrigation design done, it would benefit you to have the, fl the pressure or the flow test done at the front at the back. You might find the front of the house has a massive, uh, well not massive, it might be 20 or 30% higher because all the water has to go through all of the small pipes and they're using 15 mil pipe or whatever. Uh, I didn't talk about this when we were inside but I might get you guys to screw some sprinklers, anyone that hasn't done it yet. Uh, never, ever, ever put thread tape on a fitting that goes into a sprinkler. You'll find on the bottom of the sprinklers it says no pipe dope. That's a US for no thread tape. Uh, who wants to do this? Someone, jump in. Just to get a feel for it, if you haven't done it before, um, it's very much a feel thing. Ultimately, if you haven't, anyone not done this before? Yep. Ultimately, you just screw it in until it gets tight. Don't go too crazy, you will break it. Uh, it's not, firstly, it's not gonna leak. And if it does, it's gonna leak small amounts of water into a lawn that you're trying to irrigate with the sprinkler. So it's not a big deal. So how, yep. So that's probably tighter than you'd need to go, but right on there. Yeah, so you go tighter than that. And then that's it. So there, you could build all them in advance. These sprinklers that we've got here are a Hunter three inch pop-up. When we talk about two inch, three inch, four inch pop-up, well, that's a two inch, sorry. It's the height that it pops up above there. So a lot of people will come in here or to one of the locations and call this a four inch pop-up because it's a hundred mil. It's not, it's a two inch pop-up. A two inch pop-up is probably not tall enough for the majority of lawn situations that you're going to be dealing with unless it's going to be fine cut turf cut with a cylinder mower and maintained really well because as you can see it's only popping up that high you put that in a kaikuya lawn and don't mow it for two weeks because they've gone on holidays or whatever you're going to be spraying straight into the lawn and it's not going to work very well so we try to go three inch where possible uh, these have a flushing nozzle on top of them so that'll pop up so when we install the system that pops up that's that opens and it squirts water out of the sprinkler the idea behind that is to keep the 
um, the line's completely free of debris. The MP rotator especially is a really sensitive nozzle. If you get dirt in that nozzle, there's a good chance that nozzle was never going to work again. You can't flush it, you can't soak it in chlorine, there's nothing that's going to change it. The R-Van, which is what we've got here made by Rainbird, are a little bit more um, flow capable. They're a 14 mil an hour precip. You guys will remember I talked about the MP rotator being 11 mil. These put out more water per minute. The holes are slightly bigger. They throw a heavier jet. They are still matched precipitation, so you can design them on a system and they work like the lawn will get the same amount of water in every square meter. When they're on, you can actually pull this up and it will flush. So if you have got dirt or debris in the system, obviously it's got to get through that filter. Um, then you pull that up. So what will happen, we'll put these down on the ground, we'll clip them up. We lift up the flushing nozzle, undo it, screw the, the sprinkler head onto the, the body. Now these will be preset at 90 or 180 degrees. We can grab the throat of that sprinkler and turn that shaft to change the angle of the sprinkler. These sprinkler heads are going to adjust one way only. So like if that's a fixed arc, they'll open and close the other arc. I think they're a 90 to 210. So 90 degrees to 210, you adjust the angle by pushing down on the top and turning them. These are all adjustable by hand. If you want to adjust the right hand side, I think you'll have to turn it back to get the right hand side where it needs to go and then you adjust the angle by going out, but we'll do that. All right, so I might get, if I get a few of you to all do this together, we'll be able to get it done quickly. Um, who wants to build a manifold for me? Yeah, sweet. You know what you're doing? Yep. So if you want to put all that together. So this is the swivel manifold we looked at before. We're going to put a solenoid valve on each. Uh, we've got a Rainbird and a Hunter valve here. There's no real um, reason why we use one or the other. They're both really good quality brands. They both have good warranties. Uh, the Rainbird valve has a slightly larger coil. I think that that sometimes can help you from a uh, debris standpoint, we talked before about the dirt getting stuck in there. This will this makes it less likely. Uh, when you're putting a solenoid valve on a manifold, it's important to take note of the direction of flow. This has been done correctly. There's arrows on the valve that point the way the water's going. We're going to then run some water out of this ball valve to get it to that solenoid valve bank. Who wants to put that together for me? Anybody? Come on, guys. So thread tape, we're going to thread tape this fitting into that. Actually, we need to put a dual check in, don't we? Do you want to thread tape that for me? I don't think there's enough thread tape on there, but... So with thread tape, there's a technique that you can use that you want to hold it a certain way and turn the thread tape around. We're thread taping this clockwise so that when we screw it into the, the fitting, the thread tape doesn't unravel. So any of these mains pressure threaded fittings that aren't O-rings, so these here, the guys have got O-rings on them. There's no thread tape on there because we don't need thread tape. The O-ring is what makes the seal. Uh, I have seen people do it sometimes. <laughs> Try to avoid it. The manufacturers recommend you don't do it. They also say these are hand tight. I think sometimes you'll find that you're not going to get them hand tight enough that they'll stop leaking. That's when you're going to grab the multi-grips. Can you grab me some multi-grips, please? Um, and you might just give them a really small tweak. So There is a, there is a over-tightening is a thing. 100% because what you do is you crush the o-ring and it goes flat and then it just it's not it's just not doing anything so um, This has obviously been pre thread taped. It's upside down a plumber don't have to install a backflow valve. As in you don't need a plumber to do it. Yeah. I think you technically do I haven't looked at it RPZs obviously, yes. I think that, like from what I understand commercially they want a licensed plumber to do up to the master valve and then and an irrigator can go after master valve so technically, you'd probably need, if you had a master valve here, um, but it's not, like it's not being regulated and I don't think it's being watched. Can you get me a nipple? Actually, no. Why is that upside down? Yeah, do you want to take... Look, six probably, like, yeah, it, white thread tape's quite thin. For the purpose of what we're doing, I wouldn't stress too much. The technique that's being used here is correct, so he's got how he's got it tight and you keep going, but that's heaps of thread tape. Um, do you want to take that nipple out and put it in that end and then put your end connector in that end? Because obviously the direction of flows around the wrong way. So what we're going to do is we're going to screw that um, backflow prevention device here. Then we're going to have blue line come down and then we're going to send some blue line out to that manifold. So uh, 
who does anyone want to do this? Obviously, this is, I, I advertise this as hands-on. So, if you want to get your hands on it, now's the time. Um, I'm not strong. Multi, he's got some multi grips there. Yeah, if you can. <coughs> so having a shifter, a shifting spanner for this part of it's going to be helpful, but it's not going to be completely necessary. These are the blue line fittings that we choose to stock. They're a Filmac 3G. Filmac, uh, Filmac 3G are made here in South Australia, down at uh, North Plimpton near the airport. Uh, they're a reusable blue line fitting. They are a compression fitting. So the idea is that you slide pipe in here and tighten that up and it crushes around the pipe, makes the seal. They're a really good quality um, fitting. Just throw some more thread tape on there. Don't stress about it. It's just, it'll come straight apart. He was obviously re removing the thread tape off of that nipple. That would be what we'd be doing if we were going to leave it here. I'm more concerned about getting this working so that you guys are not here at four o'clock than that being perfect. But that tech, so that to see that there, you've done that there is the opposite of what you want to be doing for your thread tape because as you're doing it, you're pulling it out. So you want to have it that way. Right. So by holding it that way, then you can maintain that. You can keep it tight like that. You know what I mean? And you're not getting further and further away. So um, that can go in there. Then if you can get that one in there. So we've got no thread tape on that. We're going to work on the O-ring of this sealing that. Uh, we're going to run some drip tube off of one of these valves and some sprinklers off the other one. So we're going to put the pressure reducer there. Same deal, make sure that you're following your direction of flow. There's an arrow on there. There might be some small leaks from this because we're not going too crazy with our thread tape, but I just want to get it done. Uh, can someone prepare me this cable? Can you sheath me probably that much off of each and then take like a centimetre off of each cable? Yeah. So why is that spinning there? So this here, when that actually comes apart. So the non-return valve, this might be beneficial for you guys to actually see. The non-return valve, it's called a dual check valve. It's got two non-return spring checks. So there's that one and then there's another one in there. Water goes through one way but can't go through the other. It's take, it's take apartable, that's correct, English. It's dismantleable so that you can actually get in there and you know if there was some debris stuck in the non-return valve, you can service it. That's obviously just going to tighten up. That O-ring's going to seal it and I'd say you're going to be fine there anyway. So that's that. So that'll go here. You want to be careful not to get your thread tape into the actual fitting. Like you want to make sure that it's there because it's going to go down the system and obviously potentially clog stuff up. Obviously you've had a licensed plumber do all this bit. This is for display purposes only. So then we've got that um, metric fitting there. These metric fittings come preset with about two threads exposed. You don't want to, when you buy these, you don't want to play around with them and tighten them up in the shop and then open them up again. You kind of want to keep them where they're set because that's what they're meant to be done. Well, that's how they're meant to be done. We've got a piece of blue line here that we're going to use. We'll put an elbow at the bottom of it. You can buy blue line in rolls or straight lengths. When we're performing work like this, a lot of the time it's going to benefit you to buy a straight length because it, it gets a bit... Ugh. I'm just going to cut off enough to do this. Have we got cutters there? Lise, can you get me some cutters? Oh, he's got some. So I talked before about using these to cut poly. You can use them to cut blue line as well. Obviously, you can measure that. The way this is cut is just by turning. Same deal. So you've got a mains pressure rated pipe that you can cut like butter. Then you can straighten that up like that. So you really just want to get that as straight as possible. This is probably not the, the prettiest way of doing it. You could have a plumber do this in copper and have it all nicely against the wall and then get it underground. Then I'm going to reduce, I'm going to kind of cut to, like I'm cutting to that there. Everyone can see that. That's where this is going to go in. We've got an elbow there. Does anyone want to do this? Like I've done this a lot. Okay. Yep. So if you want to put an elbow, you want to, have you done it before? Uh, maybe. <laughs> so you're going to push that in. Tighten that up and then get that on the ground and then kind of work out how long you want this. Yeah, yeah. Cut that off and then stick it in there. So if you're having trouble getting it in, you just want to back that nut off a bit and then push, you should be able to push it in. Yeah, it's not getting. Yeah, that's in. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. All right, what do we got you guys to do next? If you want to put a director in that other, um, that director in there. 
So right here, we're gonna put a director in this solenoid valve that's going to the sprinklers. We would thread tape that fitting if you run out of thread tape. Yeah, thread tape, please. Yep, so give it a twist, perfect. So you should be able to get that up underneath it, push it in. You might need to back that nut off a bit again because it's like half closed and then you, that should be enough. I can't really feel it now. Is that right? Yep, there you go. Okay. So now we're gonna point this out to wherever we need to go. I'm not gonna cut any more blue line. So the blue line that we're using for this is a mains pressure rated pipe. It's rated to 1250 kilopascals, which is way more than you're gonna be pumping through it. That can go in there, and then we'll put the manifold out here, and then we're gonna irrigate out here. I'll just back that nut off again a bit, I reckon. Does it feel like it's in? Yeah, that's in. That was in. Yep. Just hold it in and tighten it up. So these, at 25 mil, you're going to be able to tighten these blue line fittings up by hand pretty easily. Once you get into the kind of 32 and 40 mil, you're going to need to use a, a tool, either a multi-grip tool or... Um, so that's going to be fine. That'll hold mains pressure. Now we've got our manifold. We've got our cable coming. I'll use this controller um, because it's here. Uh, Toro make the same controllers that, they don't make the same controllers. The controllers do the same thing as a Hunter controller as does a Rainbow controller. The concept's the same. It's transformed electricity out to these ports. This was a direct ripoff of the Hunter XC controller. Uh, I'll just leave it up here. You'd obviously mount this to a wall or wherever you're going to put it. You can run conduit for the cable. Most people don't put their cable in conduits in the ground. They only put it down the wall. So. If you're seeing that red cable kind of going through garden beds, don't get too precious about it. People are doing it. If you want to put it in conduit, you can. So what we're going to do is join that manifold to this blue line. Does someone want to do that? That hasn't like, get into it guys. How you going? Pretty good. Looking good, mate. All right, I'm going to do it. No one else wants to do it. You got it? You do it. Cool. <laughs> And then we're going to cut some poly. I need someone else to do this bit. I want to put the sprinklers together and clip them up. So anyone that wants to try their hand with some Cobra clamps. Yeah, I think so. So when, you bought, when you're using poly pipe, you want to cut all of your strapping off. This is a technique that I used to use when unrolling poly pipe. You want to try and remove, like unroll the poly pipe the same way that it went onto the spool. So if you're working with someone else, you can have, obviously have them hold one end of the pipe. Um, so if you want to hold that for me. So we, if I'm doing this, with, especially with drip tube, I'm going to walk back and unroll poly pipe the same way that it would have gone onto the machine in the, in the area. And then I'm just going to lay it down and that's going to stay straightish. Now, obviously, like I said, before, let me have a look at that end, sorry. I'm just going to cut, the, this has been cut with a hacksaw in that stinky warehouse. I was going to give that a, a cleaner cut, making sure we're putting the cobra clamp on first before we push it onto the fitting. And then we can put some sprinklers and set the sprinklers up. We'll need some bricks, I think. Yep, go for it, man. The advantage of having a landscape supplies yard. So I'm just gonna use bricks to support this. Obviously, um, on site, you're going to be putting these in trenches and then packing soil around the sprinklers in the areas that you're going to put them. We've, we've got these, I'm just gonna do a, um, a square of sprinklers in this area just to show you how it works. So does anyone just wanna do this? I know, I'm, I'll stop asking eventually, but if you wanna cut, um, we need, oh, I need a side outlet T actually. Who's here that knows what I'm talking about? Can you ask for a side outlet T that'll fit these sprinklers for me, Lise? One of them, yeah, take that off. I need one with a T. Well, no, just get me a T. That'll be all right. Um, so these fittings come as a side outlet T, so they've got another branch off them. I was going to put one there, but we won't. We'll just make the loop and then we'll cut a T into it. 
With looping a system, it's not completely necessary to loop it. A lot of people, it's a question we commonly get asked. You could just do a C-shape. Um, by looping it, it balances the flow and the pressure and it, obviously it's perfect. If you're trying to trench through six meters of shale and cement and shit on that edge and you don't want to do it, it's, you would not visually be able to see the difference. So um, if you want to cut, we'll cut this here and then put your cobra, like get your cobra clamps on first, obviously and then get your fitting in and then build a square of these at roughly, and then we'll get it, we'll tee that in later. So same deal, we'll just add all them to it. Yeah, so here actually you can put this here. So you get your tee here. Yep. Oh, how's that gonna work? Um, yep. Yep. Yeah? And then we'll go, yeah, like that. Yep, so you're just teeing into the system. So just put that there and then have your elbow there and then launch down that way and put another another side out of that elbow. So I need another length of the poly here to connect you, these. You might need to cut, yeah, you're gonna have to yeah. cut a little bit off. You can cut it off of here. Uh, so we'll do that. I'm conscious of time. Does anyone need to leave at three? I think I said I had it till 3.30, but you guys are up for 10, yep. Overtime. <laughs> so the drip tube runs the same concept. So if we've got, I'm gonna put the drip tube um, off of that solenoid valve. You can imagine, I'm hoping you can all visualize that this is obviously in a garden situation where we're gonna send poly pipe from one of the solenoid valves out to the garden bed. Yep, so then do that and then just cut another piece off and keep going. But yeah, keep, you can do all your clips up as you go or you can do them after, whatever works. Just kind of two or three meters. I just wanna be able to do a square of pipe. So maybe cut it where he is now and just cut three piece four pieces that long and then we'll just build a square of sprinklers just so I can give you an idea of how it all looks. The, um, does someone want to do the, you want to finish the wire joints for me? Yep. Who was asking before about wire joints that wasn't quite sure? Do you want to be involved in this bit? Yeah, yeah okay, so do you want to help? Yeah. Have you done this before, Liam? Yeah. All right, do you want to just help? What was the name, sorry? Leaf. Leaf. Um, if you want to help show him what we're doing. So obviously these, the cables that we've, we've got are going to get wired up over here. Um, where's the screwdriver? So you'll go in there and you give yourself, you want to give yourself a lot of room to work. And then I would have some needle nose pliers and I'd be grabbing each of these one at a time and then undoing the, the um, screw. I'm just going to go get a screwdriver. You want to? I'll get you to do it actually. And you want to get that underneath that metal plate, right? Now, these have been very well prepared. You could snip them back a bit if you wanted to, if you didn't want that exposure. Yep. And then you're just doing that up. That's right? this, that's so that's your common. Yeah. Then you go one and two with the other two. They probably look like they're already open. Has anyone got any questions about this? This is all makes sense. Like you've, this is, you've seen this before. Yep. Cool, cool, cool. Up happily just enjoying some imported Heineken. So with the, um, we've got obviously a sprinkler on that body. Some people will use their flushing nozzles and flush the system, others won't. It's really what works for you. Um, we'll flush these first just so you see what they look like and obviously that one's already on there and then we'll adjust them. Oh yeah, do you want to do these two now? So obviously you're going to do one of each. So I'd be getting the um, getting some cutters and getting these kind of nice and clean so that comes off. Um, so you're getting one from each valve and I'd be getting that with the common and probably just twisting all three together. What's that? You need to run two common cables. So one common to, but, yeah. but yeah, so each valve has to have a wire to the common. If there was a third valve here, that third valve would have one wire twisted to those. If there was a fourth valve, that would have a third and a fourth that all be twisted together until you get to the point where you can't physically get any more joiners. So you'll see when he does this. So you'll put that, that's your common. You'll go into there. To the middle? Yep. It doesn't really matter. Like it's, it doesn't matter. But what you'll, if you'll see here, we've got so much cable going on there. They're not, they're not going in the hole. So, but it's gone far, I'll take this off. It's gone far enough past it it's almost it hasn't gone if you have a look like if you take that out like it's really on edge but that'll do it it'll work you want to just make sure there you go so i've just shoved it in further so at what point would you say that it's all right like as soon as it's minimum? as soon as it's past like probably there like the bridge so those you want that that metal's the joint yep. so when you crush that down that metal has to crush that so i'd be holding that upside down 
so I can visually see that. Get that there, get my fingers out of the way. There you go. So you've got, I'm all right, you didn't get me. That's all in. You've had gel come out and clear, like you probably. That gel, what is it? It's silicon. Silicon? Yeah. Oh, so, but you see here, like well, I can see that metal. There's actually metal there. You don't want to be able to see that. So you want the gel to come out. So it might've been a case that we were better off putting two into one hole and one into the other and really getting them in there and then closing them off, but they'll work. In the you holes- just go one, one and one. You can, yeah. The thing, well, like I was saying before, these cables are so skinny. I worry about the- The connection. Like we'll do it with these next ones, right? So you've got uh, one of them and one of them. So do, you can do that. So you put one, one in there and crush it and then do the same with the white and the, the other one. The drip tube will come out of here. So a lot of times people will put drip tube, like you might run black poly until we get to the garden bed and then we start putting drip tube over here so that you're not dripping in the valve box or, yeah. So a lot of, you'll see it, people will kind of put this on here and then the drip tube will be leaking in the valve box. Oh, office hands. Um, oh man, it's the most work I've done for a year. The drip tube will just fold the end over. You can put an end piece in there. Actually, do we have oh, air release valve and flushing valve? So we'll put this in the end. So with drip tube, we use air release valves to let air in and out of the pipe. And we've got flushing valves to clean the pipe. Um, I haven't put the air release valve on. I should have. I'll put a flushing valve on the end here. Oh, we need some 13 mil cobras. No, can you grab me those two clamps, man? Thanks. So they'll go on there. This is a really bad example of a drip system, but just to, like I said, in the interest. Is there a, have you got a good recommendation for where that taps? <laughs> the lowest point. Lowest point. Ideally, because debris is obviously going to push to the lowest point and then the air release valve at the highest point, air is going to go out at the highest point. It's not always practical. Uh, a lot of people will put the air release valve here and so it's in the same valve box as the solenoids and then it's there. Um, can you explain the air release valve? Yep. Please? So with drip tube, Drippers aren't designed to have air going in and out. And when a system turns off, if it drains out, it's going to replace that water with air. So if you've got a sloped system, all the water is going to go down to one end. What this does is it lets the air in. So this will be at the highest point. So once that water starts draining out, air gets in here and fills that pipe back up with air rather than it trying to suck the air into the drippers and drawing dirt into the drippers and potentially blocking them up. It is the most basic technology. It's a rubber O-ring on the bottom. When water hits it, it seals it off and it closes and when it lets go gravity takes care of the rest and it lets air back in just, the just for drip tube you wouldn't use it on sprinklers um, with sprinklers draining you can use a check valve in the sprinkler so the you can actually screw a rubber fitting into the bottom of certain sprinkler brands you can't do it in every brand these hunter bodies you can actually retrofit a check seal into it so if we had a sloped area when you turn the system off the water's not going to run down and leak out and you'll find you've got big puddles at the end and it will hold all the the water in the pipe this tube here from Netafem is a non-drain dripper. So the idea is that when you turn it off, it stays primed full of water, reduces the need for these to potentially to not even needing them at all, but it's a safeguard. Would you ever use one of those in a system that's just like shrublers or something like that? Uh, not really, no, because if the shrublers are above ground, there's no chance of them drawing anything in. Um, the, the actual, if you, I, I, we can cut a dripper open, I'll show you the actual internal labyrinth as they call it of the dripper is so fine that it doesn't take much to block up and there's only one hole so if an ant gets in there or dies if you guys if someone wants to do these clamps up for me um yeah you want the tool oh he's got the tool uh so then the, obviously the controllers are wired up we got we got water perfect someone was listening <laughs> uh so now we can turn the valves on obviously if you don't want to get wet i wouldn't stand especially you that sprinkler could spray you so i'll turn this on now <laughs> you get in video is this in case i get wet perfect um so obviously depending on the controller brand that you're using at this point you might have a wi-fi app on your phone and you can actually just walk around the property and test your sprinklers especially on large properties you can just turn the the valve on and have a look around. I'm gonna do it manually from here. Um, scheduling and controller programming, something that I'd cover off in an advanced training session. You have to sign up. Ah, if you're having trouble with valves popping up and this bit's not in the right bit, thanks mate. 
that will cause you some problems. Uh, in the event that we don't have power and we do want to test it, we can turn this on. Do you want to turn that ball valve on for me, man? Yep. So that's now, there you go. So see there, we've got that initial, you know how I said about it kind of leaking. On the upside, everything's around the right way. So, oh gosh. We're not gonna get paid for this one, I reckon. Uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time on it because I just wanna show you it, but if you've got the leak, if there's leaking like this happening, it's likely gonna be fixed like that. So now we're all good. Um, you notice I gave it like an eighth of a turn, I wasn't, trying to wrench it through. So manually, we can turn the sprinklers on by doing that. And that's gonna pop them up. Yep. <laughs> Whose microphones am I wearing? All right. Um, Slick. So, we, we've flushed the system really well. So all I did to turn it on, like I haven't programmed it. If I wanted to program it, um, do you want me to show you? Manual run? Did all I did was manual. I just went around to there oh, and then went like that and then go back to auto yeah. and it starts. So that's, they're on now. Go back to auto? Yeah, you have to go back to auto. Yeah. yeah, you can't leave. Or you can leave it on manual, but I don't think it'll turn on until you go back to auto. So, but like I've got, where's my phone? Like it was in my back pocket. What I was doing, Michael. So like my house, if I want, I've got the Wi-Fi set up on my Rainbird controller here. I can open my controller from here now. I did a delay, I might water now, say, so I'll go, I want to water. I know zone three is my new seed, I want to put it on for three minutes. My kids are probably on the lawn, yep, 320, this would be perfect. <laughs> oh, that was zone, so they've gone all two minutes. Um, I didn't want that, I wanted just the one zone. So I go to manual, zone three, Three minutes, okay, start watering. And you'll probably get a phone call from my wife in about 30 seconds. Um, and that'll pop up my system. So this is really easy to use. I've just inherited three of these at yeah. funerals of their varying ages. Yeah, they're easy to use. With these, honestly, if you're having trouble, the best thing you can do is go back to bait, like reset the whole thing back to start and start from scratch. Because what you'll find, especially with a four station controller, people get confused between um, four start times, four run times, four stations, and they t they think that they're programming station four when they're actually putting the fourth run time on. So then you're having like all these start times, and there's just water everywhere. So, yep. on, like I can, I'll show you. So this hasn't been programmed. Yep. Um, so it starts at auto. Uh, it's still counting down. So we'll just turn that off. Yep. <sighs> but I would suggest where possible get a, a Wi-Fi controller. All you need to do is get it on the wall, get the Wi-Fi into it, connect the Wi-Fi to your phone, and then and you can do it from anywhere. So now, right now it knows it's 2021, so you're pressing, so that's fine. Next, uh, so six, two, next, 24 hour, makes sense for a lot of people, leave it at that. Um, and then it's what, 1520, so you just hold that down until you get to 1520. It should start speeding up at some point. Sick. Thanks, Glenn, no worries, thanks for coming. Make sure if there's food or drink there, help yourself, don't be shy. I hope you got something out of it. Um, yeah, it was good to see you.